Well, it's uh, 2.45, so I think we'll go ahead and get uh, started with uh, scientific session number six. Uh, we have uh, four presentations today. Um, first presentation is by Dr. Uh, Josh Fleischer on detailed post-discharge opioid consumption patterns following major abdominal surgery. Uh, and this uh, manuscript is uh, eligible for the uh, Jack Barney Award. Uh, so it's part of that competition. Dr. Fleischer. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Oh, the microphone's not close enough. Thank you. Perfect. One of the most common interventions that we've used in the past decade to improve surgical opioid stewardship has been the implementation of opioid prescribing guidelines. Most of these recommend that we prescribe a set number of pills following common surgical procedures. While an important step in improving opioid stewardship, these guidelines do have several limitations. Most importantly, we know that despite the guideline use, we continue to prescribe too many opioids. This figure from a recently published paper shows that we continue to prescribe three times as many opioids as patients are currently consuming. In this study, the number of pills recommended by most consensus guidelines were needed for only the highest quintile of opioid users. Another issue with current guidelines is that they don't have an ability to be patient-centered. Most suggest, like I said earlier, prescribing a set number of pills based on procedure type alone. In a previous paper published by our group, we argued that future guidelines should be more patient-centered. And we recommend doing this by using the metric 24-hour pre-discharge opioid consumption, or 24-hour PDOC. As you can see in this figure, at our institution currently, we are not uh, prescribing based on this metric at all. There is significant variability in how we prescribe opioids to our patients. Other studies at different centers have noted similar variability in opioid prescribing. In order to generate improved opioid prescribing guidelines, we wanted to see how various prescribing guidelines currently compare to what patients are actually using once they leave the hospital. To gather this data, we sent all adult patients who underwent major surgery home with an opioid logbook. All they had to do was write down the number of opioid pills they used. We then assessed if any patient or clinical factors were associated with increased 24-hour PDOC, discharge opioid prescription size, or post-discharge opioid consumption. We also created a number of theoretical discharge prescriptions based on existing opioid prescribing guidelines to determine the efficacy of these guidelines to not only meet the needs of uh, patients in terms of pain relief, but also minimize the number of leftover pills. We also included a prescription based on this metric, 24-hour PDOC, to see how that would fare. Out of 99 patients, 62 returned a completed opioid logbook and the median 24-hour PDOC was 22.5 morphine milligram equivalents. This is equivalent to less than three 5 milligram oxycodone pills. On multivariable analysis, older patients use fewer opioids, and patients with substance abuse use nearly five times more opioids during this 24-hour period. Almost all patients in the cohort received a multimodal approach to pain, with 96% of patients receiving Tylenol and 70% receiving NSAIDs. Discharge opioid prescriptions were a median of 15 pills, equivalent to 100 MME. Patients who had an open surgical approach, and again, patients with a substance use disorder, uh, were prescribed uh, larger prescriptions at discharge. Of those who did return a logbook, nearly a third reported that they didn't use any pills. Even with that, the median pill usage total for all patients was only three equivalent to 17.5 MME. The only factors associated with increased home usage were gabapentin use and patients who underwent surgery for a diagnosis of cancer. 16% of patients required opioid refills. So if we look at median opioid consumption for all the patients following discharge, we see a couple things. One, patients take very few opioids overall, and they take them for a very short period of time. Most patients, as you can see here, were left with over 60% of the pills they were prescribed. And if we exclude the patients who didn't take any pills, the median time to opioid cessation was only three days. By two weeks after discharge, 97% of patients had finished taking opioids. So what does this mean when we compare it to um, the currently available consensus guidelines out there? If we compare, um, sorry, opioid prescriptions avoided 
is uh, patients who would not have received an opioid prescription under that specific guideline. And prescription adequacy refers to patients who would not have required an opioid refill. So you can see that our actual prescriptions compared very well to what the national consensus guidelines recommend. Our two times 24 hour PDOT guideline, however, would have reduced the median number of pills per patient by nine. And if you look at the leftover pills, it's double digits in every scenario, actual and all consensus guidelines. And in our proposed two times 24 hour PDOC, it drops to 2.5. The additional perk of these proposed guidelines is not only reducing the number of pills, but allowing for us to be patient centered. In this scenario, 14% of patients would have actually received a larger discharge prescription than they actually did or than would have been recommended by any of the consensus guidelines. So patients with higher pain needs are accounted for. So in conclusion, most patients after surgery use a very small number of opioids after they leave the hospital. The median number of pills used was three. And this cohort included patients with big operations, hypex, hepatectomies, whipples, APRs. Our discharge opioid prescriptions were in line with recommendations from currently available opioid prescribing guidelines. However, as you saw, these prescriptions still left patients with a large number of unused pills. And from this data, we're able to propose the following opioid prescribing guidelines. It's very simple. You take what the patient received 24 hours prior to leaving the hospital, and you double it. This could lead to much smaller prescriptions and fewer leftover opioids for the vast majority of patients. The study does have several limitations. It is a single center study and patients may receive and take opioids differently at other centers. The data on consumption was also acquired through self-report. This may be a social desirability bias and patients may report taking fewer opioids than they actually did. And finally, it may be an invalid assumption that opioid consumption was constant across all scenarios. We know that if we prescribe patients fewer opioids, they take fewer opioids. And so in the proposed two times 24 hour PDOC scenario, it is likely that patients would have used fewer opioids. The next step for this research is to actually prescribe to patients in this manner and see how they do. And we've actually already started doing that. And we've nearly completed data collection over a six month period. Proving the viability of these guidelines in a pilot study would allow for a larger trial. And if we're able to prove that this strategy works, it will allow for greatly reducing the number of pills surgeons prescribe, limiting our impact on the opioid epidemic. Thank you. Our discussion for this paper is uh, Dr. Timmerman from uh, University of South Dakota. Is this on? I think it is. So, any good study, I have three minutes here or so, and uh, I thought maybe I should personalize this a little bit. Um, in 2017, I underwent a rotator cuff repair for a misadventure trying to start a chainsaw. There's so many things wrong with that as a surgeon. It's a same day surgery, so no 24 hours. Post-op, I was prescribed 30 tablets of hydrocodone, five milligrams, the equivalent of five MME per pill, for a total of 150 MME as my discharge prescription. Being the good surgeon that I thought I was and thinking I'm as tough as anybody, I found myself consuming two tablets of hydrocodone, as I was told to, every four hours around the clock, and if any of you have had shoulder surgery for rotator cuff, um, I had absolutely no pain relief. But by that 24 hour period, I had taken 12 tabs, the equivalent of 60 MME, and had 18 remaining when the follow-up phone call occurred the next day by the nursing staff. And I noted to them I had zero pain relief. So they prescribed me 30 tablets of tramadol. 50 milligrams, again, five MME, for another 150 MME. Same thing, two tabs every four, 12 consumed, had 18 remaining. So now I'm up to 36 pills left over in two days. On the third day, by this time, I was having shortness of breath. I couldn't sleep. The pain was through the roof. 
I was, of course, having the hallucinations, the irritability, the agitation, and the very noticeable constipation, but zero pain relief. So I went to the ER more concerned that I was throwing a blood clot because of my shortness of breath. Well, the doctor said, you look like you're in a lot of pain. And I said, oh, no, it's down to a nine. I think I'm doing good. But he gave me an IV. And before the fentanyl was in, my pain relief was gone. Well, we do these things at Sanford called these chips. And we can find out whether or not we can break down pain pills into the proper morphine to get the pain relief. And it turns out I'm one that doesn't do it. I get all the side effects, but no pain relief. So I felt pretty good for about an hour and guess what they did? They prescribed me another 30 tablets of Oxycontin, five milligrams, which is a direct derivative of morphine. So for a total of 225 MME, I used 10 of those and in three days, I had been prescribed 525 MME equivalents and had 46 pills remaining. Now this story has a kind of a silver lining in that I took those 46 pills to my nearby high school, sold them in the parking lot and was able to pay for my entire surgery. <laughs> Seriously, this is a big deal. And I congratulate the authors for the prospective attempts to quantify and further define post-operative opioid prescription practices, and even more importantly, the actual consumption and necessity of those pills. You were able to compare your data with three other recognized medical centers, namely Dartmouth, Michigan, and Mayo, and I think you fared well in your comparisons, actually probably even doing a little better. You went on to construct a proposal then of prescribing two times a metric measurement of 24 hours pre-discharge -dis opioid consumption, your PDOC, based on NME as a hypothesis, but then went ahead and still gave your 30 pills, or I'm sorry, your 15 pills, and then made your observations, which to me was pretty impressive that I think you mentioned they used three pills and most were done by post-op day three, taking their opioids. You, um, actually did do what everyone else did. You prescribed the usual 100 MME with the 15 pills. You still sent them home with that. But if they took three, they were still averaging about anywhere from 12 or more pills based on the MME left over. Nearly all of them had more than 10 of the 15 pills left over. In my case, sound familiar? So after the several pain pills I had to take to consume to review this paper, because this is pharmacology and I'm not real strong in this, I would tell you that God puts you in the right place at the right time. And in my circumstance, I was able to apply it to my own personal experience and say, yeah, this really is a problem. So I have four questions for you. First is, I admire your inclusion of the patients with admitted chronic pain to your group. But what percentage of those individuals were the ones that did not turn in their logs? And also, are they the ones that did need additional pain prescription pills? Because you note that 38% did not turn in their logs and 16% needed additional pain pills. Next, interesting to me, you excluded non-English speaking patients, yet many may say that that may represent some of your immigrant workers, your laborers. And it kind of flies in the face of what we're all talking about with DEI these days. And that might be an absolutely appropriate group to be looking at. What about fentanyl patches, which is a very popular thing these days. And you did mention that you did send people home with things like salon paws, lidocaine patches and the like. How do you think that will bear into your future use of your two times your uh, 24 hour opioid use? And then I was glad that you looked at abdominal surgery, but if I'm, maybe I misread it, you included open versus laparoscopic versus robotic operations. And if I'm not mistaken, 
Most patients with open and laparoscopic, I'm sorry, open are different than those that may have undergone laparoscopic or robotic surgery as to how much pain they had. And many of them are there only for 24 hours and their immediate needs might be higher than someone who is in the hospital for two weeks and they have virtually no pain when they go home and therefore are not taking anything. When you used your new combination of two times the amount, um, I found that interesting that you would have noted 38, almost 39% of the patients would not have even received an opioid prescription when they went home. Therefore, of note, the prescribing adequacy rate of your two times the 24 PDOC guidelines would have fallen and actually, instead of having only 16% calling for more prescriptions, you would have almost 25 people percent rather calling for an additional prescription. So this is the kind of old guy in the room question. Who's taking the call on the weekend to fill that prescription? And when they find out you only gave three and the old guy says, they gave you how much for pain? And now I got to take the call at two in the morning because they only got three pain pills. I would like to thank the authors for their timely delivery of the manuscript, also the Southwestern Surgical Congress for this opportunity to convey my questions and comments. This issue is without doubt a necessary and crucial assessment of our prescription practices, and I congratulate you on your initiative and deliberate analysis. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer all four of those questions here briefly. Um, in terms of your first question about uh, patients with chronic pain, it kind of ties into the third question as well. Um, we did include patients with chronic pain and patients who are on opioids coming into surgery. Um, and the reason being, we feel that these proposed guidelines allow for personalization that will allow uh, patients with higher pain needs, such as those with chronic pain to be included. And we don't feel that we necessarily need to prescribe to these patients differently. They can continue taking their home medications, whether it's a fentanyl patch or OxyContin. And then for their acute post-surgical pain, we prescribe to them in the same way we prescribe to everybody else. Um, we found uh, that, I guess in, a, in our more recent results, we found that that's an acceptable way to do it. Um, and that they do not require a larger amount of refills from their surgeon, and they can go back to the person who is prescribing them their chronic pain medications. Um, I think that in much of the opioid literature, which we're somewhat inundated by, patients with chronic pain and prior opioid use are often excluded. And this is a group that we really need to study more and include in these studies, because this is a group that all of us as surgeons struggle to prescribe to. Um, in terms of non-English speaking patients, this was simply a logistics issue. I agree that it's uh, not ideal. Um, I will say that Utah is a fairly homogenous um, population, and I don't think we missed a lot of patients in that, but there was an element of education from our uh, pharmacists that went along with this study, um, and uh, they were not able to do that in Spanish, unfortunately. Um, and then the final question, talk, you asked um, about open versus laparoscopic, all of these different issues. I think the benefit of... Uh, uh, a proposed guideline such as this two times 24 hour PDOC is that all of those variables cease to matter so much. There are certainly differences and there's tons of literature that proves that lap versus open versus whatever it may be has differences in how many pills these patients consume postoperatively. But this allows for us to prescribe in a patient centered manner. And so if we base it off of their actual pain needs, which we're using 24 hour pre-discharge opioid consumption as an adjunct for, then those other variables somewhat cease to matter. Thank you. Excellent presentation and manuscript. Our next uh, paper that we'll be discussing is developing a tertiary survey in the emergency general surgery population uh, by Barbara Eaton from the University of Maryland. Uh, and this uh, uh, paper is eligible for the uh, APP uh, Best Paper Award. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Southwestern Surgical Congress for the privilege of the podium. I have nothing to disclose. Emergency general surgery comprises an estimated 3 million admissions annually. 
The specialty of EGS is similar to trauma in that they are both unscheduled and time sensitive with patients that are acutely ill, high risk, and costly. These patients are eight times more likely to die, one half will have post-op complications, and the cost of their care is estimated at 28 billion annually. To drill it down a little bit further, when compared to their general surgery counterparts, EGS patients are specifically at higher risk for in-hospital mortality, medical errors, increased length of stay, and increased readmission. We can't necessarily impact the lifestyle or comorbidities of the emergent surgical patient, but there are a complement of factors that are associated with in-hospital complications that can be modified to reduce this disparity between elective and emergent admissions. These factors associated with in-hospital complications include incomplete physical exam, incorrect medication reconciliation, incomplete uh, patient history, and non-recognition of incidental findings. With this in mind, our team endeavored to create a process that would ameliorate these risks and improve outcomes. Evidence suggests that the tertiary survey is an effective means of identifying clinically significant missed injuries. Similar to trauma patients, EGS patients often require emergent intervention at admission that may preclude precise and time intensive documentation by the admitting team. And so we use the concept of a tertiary survey as a blueprint to create a structured patient assessment. The objective of this current study was to develop an EGS tertiary survey modeled after the trauma tertiary survey to enable early recognition of relevant omissions and documentation and other missing clinical findings using a systematic approach. This prospective observational study was performed on a dedicated EGS service. A tertiary survey document template was created for this purpose to be completed by service-based APPs within 72 hours of admission. The process of completing the survey included the following and then tallying any omissions or discrepancies in documentation. Physical exam with attention paid to any pre-existing wounds and indwelling catheters or devices, thorough medication reconciliation, notation of whether high alert medications were missed or incorrect in the EMR, review of all diagnostics and final radiology interpretations, and whether the patient underwent an emergent procedure within 24 hours of admission. And this is a representation of the document that we created. There were 139 EGS admissions during the study period, and of those, 108 had a completed tertiary survey performed. The majority, 62%, were performed within 48 hours of admission. More than half of the patients were admitted to floor status, followed by 41% admitted to the ICU. The majority, 81%, were admitted non-electively. And urgent and emergent procedural interventions were performed on 44% of patients within 24 hours of admission. There were 13 incidental radiographic findings not, not noted. 12 patients had wounds that were present on admission and not documented in the admission physical exam. And these included stage two or greater pressure ulcers. And the presence of a central venous catheter was admitted, omitted on six patients. Two patients had positive cultures present on admission. Most notably, 81% did not have an updated problem list, past history or diagnosis, and 72% of patients had an incomplete or incorrect medication reconciliation. This is a tally of high alert medications that were incorrectly documented during the admission medication reconciliation. Of the 78 patients who had an incomplete med rec, 68 had some error in the documentation of these high alert medications. A few of the highest frequency omissions include therapeutic anticoagulation, beta blockers, short acting narcotics that were being taken prior to admission and anti-diabetic agents. The authors acknowledge several limitations, including a small sample size and lack of control group for statistical analysis. In addition, this survey was completed by service-based APPs, and it's acknowledged that this undertaking was especially time-consuming. There are many services that do not have the adequate staffing to dedicate workflow to this type of initiative, and thus implementation of such a process may not be generalizable to all. Head to toe, oh, sorry. The implementation of an EGS 
uh, tertiary survey emphasized that crucial elements of patient history can be missed or overlooked in the emergent or emergent surgical patient and suggest that the utilization of a structured patient assessment format could be considered a beneficial strategy. Our team felt that these results warranted a change in our practice. <clears throat> a process improvement strategy that focused on thorough evaluation of all patient factors within 24 hours of admission was instituted. Clinically significant omissions and complications can result from neglecting to identify crucial and critical patient history elements. Adverse drug events can result in significant morbidity and mortality. Missed or unknown medications have the potential to cause real and serious consequences and currently account for one in three of all hospital adverse events totaling 3.5 of additional costs. In addition, there are fiscal implications to ensuring accuracy and documentation. Reportable data required by the state and quality metrics dashboard rely on accurate documentation. Neglecting to clearly document complications already present on admission, comorbidities and existing conditions can undermine severity scores and can affect payer reimbursement. The dashboard and metrics data are used in risk adjustment models and calculating case mix index, both of which require accuracy to ensure maximum reimbursement. Like trauma, EGS is busy with many moving parts and numerous providers, but we can all agree that being busy doesn't absolve us of being thorough. The concept of the tertiary survey is rooted in the recognition that omissions can occur during emergent situations. Although the trauma tertiary survey is formulated to identify missed injuries, it is reasonable to amend that target so that the focus is on modifiable factors that affect quality, metrics, and outcomes in other acute patient scenarios. Thank you. The discussion for this uh, paper is uh, Dr. Barrios from UC Irvine. Yes, um, I want to thank Southwest Surgical for the opportunity to review this paper, and I want to thank Ms. Eaton's team for a well-designed albeit, you know, the um, kind of deceptively simple design, but I will, I'll get back to that later and turning in the manuscript so that I could read it in a timely fashion and, and review it. And, I, and, and deceptively simple because it's a, something that's already in place, as you mentioned, that, that the trauma tertiary exam is meant to, to pick up missing items uh, in the patient's care that may affect uh, their physiology and their outcome. And you talk about some of those things in physiology, like, you know, smoking, hypertension, um, sepsis, COPD that may affect vital signs and that may affect hypertension, hypotension, uh, O2 sats, um, but it goes beyond that. And that's the deceptively simple part, right? Because, you, and again, you alluded to it, and I think some of us are very familiar with, you know, during grand rounds or m and saying, did you document this? Because, it, you know, for NISQIT, for instance, it puts the patient at a higher risk-adjusted factor for pre-existing conditions um, and uh, would affect even if you have the opportunity to discuss the case with the patient before they go to the OR, whether the patient even wants to undergo the procedure or what kind of risks to ex expect if they're not going to undergo that procedure. And also with Medicare, I think a lot of us are familiar with that annoying pop-up when we open the uh, medical record and it says, was this present on admission? So I, I think it obviates some of that frustration. And, and again, for Medicare reimbursement purposes, where things like skin injuries or urinary tract infections or, or line infections or DVTs were those present on admission to kind of reduce those factors, those benchmarks that we all get evaluated on. Um, and barriers to discharge, which is another thing that come, is coming up, like how long did it take you to discharge the patient and, and why did it take you so long to discharge the patient? But if you can justify it and say there were mitigating factors from day one, it might help you reduce that length of stay. So that being said, my question to your team, and I'll kind of divide it up a little bit to give you the opportunity to, to answer parts of it, um, were about the study design itself. Um, and that was, if you had a dedicated person or persons trying to survey the patients in a tertiary fashion, why did you only have 77% capture rate? Why did you only try this for three months? Um, and why did you design it in a way, for instance, that was different in the tier of data collection because yours was an observational study did you try to do like a comparative cohort of like cross-matched elective colorectal cases, for instance, or gallbladder cases so that you can have a higher tier of data? I mean, I know what the outcome is going to be, right? The elective patients probably have a much better capture of all of the data you were trying to capture in a tertiary, but why were things like this not attempted? Um, so the question about our 77% completion rate uh, is multifactorial. 
there were a handful of patients that were admitted to the service um, and were accepted from an outside hospital transfer and didn't need an operation and really didn't need to be on a surgical service and therefore were transferred to like a medicine service within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so that small number accounts for that. Um, and then there were eight patients who were admitted for 23 hour admission for uh, surgical intervention, like a lap appy or a lap coli and were gone in the morning before the APPs arrived and had time to do the, you know, their evaluation. So <clears throat> that's kind of accounts for how those were missed. Um, the, um, the question about the comparative um, study, um, it would make sense to consider in the future comparing maybe two groups or more groups. Um, the other thing that I think would be really interesting and, and maybe applicable in this scenario would be comparing other specialties that also have an acute and urgent, acute emergent, urgent emergent and elective cohort like cardiac surgery or vascular surgery and, and maybe kind of looking at how this would apply in all of those cases. I think that would be very interesting and probably fruitful. That, that's great. And then my, my other uh, thing that actually is of interest to me is, are you considering or would you considering uh, adding other data points which are actually relevant and sometimes delay discharge or, or even the decision to do an emergent case, which would be a history of alcohol use um, and ahead of time, uh, an end of life talk like a pulsed or an advanced directive or a thought of including palliative care. Um, so we did not think of the um, end of life palliative care question or the um, the most and I regret that we didn't because that's a great idea and it 100% will be added on to the, <laughs> the process. What we did include was um, something called social barriers to discharge, where we considered we basically used the um, the theory that a, a discharge be, discharge planning begins in admission. And what are the things that we need to consider for this patient as we start to you know, work on getting them out of the hospital? But I think that conversation about the advanced directive is penultimate in these patients and absolutely should be included. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Todd? Yeah, just uh, one question about the CMI. Did you guys even track CMI to see what the difference in CMI was pre and post? Because it, you, know, you talk about expense because personnel, et cetera, but you could probably pay for it by increased CMI and reimbursement, I suspect. Yeah, that's a good question. So we, um, we did this over a four month period. And um, the reason why, it, to, to answer that other question that you had kind of dovetails into this, the reason why we only did it for, for that period of time was we lost an APP. She, she left to go to another job and the, the, the decrease in staffing made it very difficult. To, to be as um, thorough. Um, as far as the case mix index and those other factors, those other metrics, I think if we had um, a little bit more time and a larger cohort, that information would be very helpful. Uh, I also do all of the um, review of all of the metrics and dashboards and readmissions for my service. And I will say that on a follow-up review of this four month period, our readmission rate decreased. That's the, the, my question would be exactly that is outcome measures. <clears throat> Obviously, you'd have to compare it to something else, but I suspect it's probably decreased length of stay, decreased readmission rate, but there's a lot of other stuff out there you haven't seen yet. Thank you. Congratulations. Great work. Thank you. Next paper is an evaluation of adjuvant chemotherapy following neoadjuvant chemotherapy and resection for borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreatic cancer. Uh, presented by Dr. Bradley Reams from the University of Nebraska. And uh, this paper is eligible for the Lowry Award. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the Southwestern Surgical Congress and the program committee for the opportunity to present our work here today. We have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer accounts for 30 to 35% of all new diagnoses of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and is characterized by significant vascular involvement that jeopardizes the feasibility of a margin negative resection. 
Despite this, numerous retrospective studies suggest margin negative resection is possible following a prolonged course of neoadjuvant combination chemotherapy and is associated with substantially improved overall survival. These survival curves from one such study show resection nearly doubles overall survival in locally advanced pancreas cancer patients, even among the subsets of patients that have received five or more months of chemotherapy. However, the multimodality management of borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer is entirely supported by retrospective evidence, and until very recently, no randomized controlled trials existed to support current practice. As a result, as a res result there's wide international variation in provider and institutional approaches to management of this complex patient cohort. While there is unanimous agreement that borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients should receive a prolonged course of neoadjuvant systemic therapy prior to consideration of exploration and resection, the role of adjuvant therapy following resection is poorly understood. Therefore, in this study, we sought to investigate the impact of adjuvant therapy following neoadjuvant therapy and resection in all patients with borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer and the subset of borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients with high risk features. To do this, we performed a retrospective study of the National Cancer Database for the years 2011 to 2017. Our cohort was borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgical resection. Our primary outcome was overall survival and our exposure was adjuvant therapy. The demographic and clinical pathologic information available for analysis included the variables listed here. Our analysis included standard parametric and non-parametric tests for comparison between groups, as well as a multivariable Cox proportional hazards regression on overall survival after adjusting for relevant characteristics of the patient and disease. We also performed multiple sensitivity analyses. Between 2011 and 2017, we identified almost 18,000 borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients of which greater than 12,000 received neoadjuvant therapy and 764 received resection. Of those patients that received neoadjuvant therapy and resection, 203 or 27% went on to receive some adjuvant therapy. Of those patients receiving neoadjuvant therapy that did not undergo resection, the vast majority initially pursued a palliative approach. Differences between patients that did or did not receive adjuvant therapy following new adjuvant therapy and resection are shown here, with significant differences seen in age, facility type, new adjuvant therapy duration, margin status, and rates of nodal positivity between the adjuvant therapy and no adjuvant therapy groups. Not surprisingly, significant predictors of adjuvant therapy use included age, margin status, new adjuvant therapy duration, the use of radiation, and nodal status. Unadjusted Kaplan-Meier analyses of survival for our study cohort are shown here. While no differences in survival following adjuvant therapy were observed for all borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients and those with positive nodes, the median survival of borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients with positive margins was significantly improved following adjuvant therapy as those patients with positive margins that received adjuvant therapy survived nine months longer than patients that received no adjuvant therapy. These results were confirmed by our multivariable Cox proportional hazards regression. In this table, the independent predictors of survival in borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients receiving neoadjuvant therapy and resection are shown in bold and included margin status, age, year of diagnosis, the location, length of stay, and nodal status. The overall survival was not impacted by the receipt of adjuvant therapy in the entire cohort. Adjuvant therapy was associated in the model with improved survival in patients with positive margins. Of no interaction terms for adjuvant therapy and nodal status and adjuvant therapy and neoadjuvant therapy duration were not significant and therefore not included in the model. And these results remained unchanged after sensitivity analyses of neoadjuvant therapy duration. So this study has several limitations that must be considered. The generalizability of this study to non-NCDB participating institutions may be limited. The lack of granularity in NCDB data, particularly related to pancreas cancer specific variables, likely results in residual unmeasured confounding. Our sample size is small. 
And as this is a retrospective analysis, the results are subject to significant selection bias. In conclusion, in this analysis, after neoadjuvant therapy and resection, adjuvant therapy was not associated with overall survival in all patients with borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer, but adjuvant therapy was associated with prolonged survival in borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer patients with positive margins after resection. However, it was not associated with overall survival in those patients with nodal metastases or short neoadjuvant therapy duration. And most importantly, these findings must be validated in future randomized controlled trials. So I'd like to once again thank the Southwestern Surgical Congress for the opportunity uh, to present our work here today, and I'd be happy to take any questions. The discussion for this paper is uh, Dr. Bonds from the University of Oklahoma. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Southwest Surgical Society for allowing me the opportunity to discuss this paper. Thank you, Dr. Reams, for getting me the paper in a timely manner. Uh, I congratulate the authors undertaking this very important clinical question. Uh, personally, patients, it's one of the most common patients that, uh, question that patients have when they come back from neoadjuvant chemotherapy is, do I have to do chemotherapy after I have surgery? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is based on the knowledge I have of my medical oncology colleagues more than any data that exists. Um, so this is a, a great question to ask. Um, I do have several questions. Obviously, due to the confines of the NCDB, uh, you had a combined borderline resectable and locally advanced uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma patients um, as a high-risk cohort. There, there is some variability in the actual risk between borderline patients and locally advanced patients. How do you think this affected your results? Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's a great question. Um, as you mentioned, the NCDB uses the AJCC TN and M staging. Um, so we do not have any granular data related to the specific resectability classifications uh, of the patients in that database. And that's certainly a recognized limitation. However, I think you know, this will probably get to multiple of your questions. Um, we are coming to realize, we have realized in the last decade that resectability classification in general is a very arbitrary distinction that does not truly reflect the biologic resectability of these patients. And, and that's certainly uh, um, represented by the fact that there are five or six competing resectability classifications <laughs> that exist and are used by various surgeons throughout the world. So uh, with that said, the uh, biologic resectability of these patients is probably pretty similar. Uh, and lots of the retrospective studies of these patients suggest that their rates of nodal positivity uh, are related heavily to how much neoadjuvant therapy they get, uh, regardless of whether they are officially borderline resectable or locally advanced. Their rates of margin positivity are much more related to how their pathological specimens are sectioned. Uh, and you know, rates are much higher in Europe than they are in the United States. And it's also related to the surgeon's specific criteria to consider an operation in patients because surgeons that are exploring more locally advanced patients naturally are probably gonna end up with more mar uh, positive margins. But all of that does not necessarily reflect the true uh, biologic potential of these patients. So I do think it's very reasonable uh, for the purposes of this study that we group them together. And there definitely is a precedent in previous literature to do that. Sure. Um, and did you consider um, adding any of those biologically uh, high risk patients, which we generally consider patients that have a higher CA99, at least on diagnosis? Yeah, I, you know, that's another excellent question. You know, that figuring out the biologic resectability versus the technical resectability of these patients is, is kind of the hottest question, uh, you know, in the, the world of HPB and surgical oncology right now. Unfortunately, the NCDB does not have any pancreas cancer specific variables. It's just a national cancer registry. So all of the variables are, are variables collected on all cancer patients to some degree. So unfortunately, we did not have any variables related to biologic assessments of resectability, uh, metabolic assessments with PET scans, biochemical assessments with tumor markers, clinical assessments with response to chemotherapy. And so that is a recognized limitation of of this study and also any study that uses NCDB. Sure. And then my last question is in regards, I mean, obviously, again, because of the NCDB, you aren't able to tell how many cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy people got. 
um, or what regimen necessarily, even though recent studies kind of have shown us prospectively that it, they're equivalent what we have right now. Um, do you think the number of cycles of, if a patient, for example, only got one cycle of adjuvant chemotherapy versus the patients who maybe got four could have confounded your findings? Yeah, I think that's another excellent question. And that was actually one of the findings of this study that I was very surprised by. I was really expecting that the neoadjuvant therapy duration before surgery was going to strongly impact both the benefit of adjuvant therapy afterwards. Um, and we didn't find that. And that was very interesting. And that's part of the reason why the, the methods was, were very comprehensive in fully studying neoadjuvant therapy uh, duration. Um, so you know, I think that's a really great question. It's certainly a limitation of the NC2B and, and this study. Uh, you know, our hypothesis about why those results um, came out the way they did is that in order to do our models for adjuvant therapy, because there was no benefit, we had to force adjuvant therapy. And because adjuvant therapy is so strongly related to the neoadjuvant therapy duration, we must think there are some collinearity. And if we force the adjuvant therapy, then the neoadjuvant therapy duration falls out. Um, but in an effort to you know, further investigate that question, we did do multiple sensitivity analyses. We basically analyzed neoadjuvant therapy duration in three different ways, mm -hmm. uh, as a categorical variable, as a dichotomous variable, and as a continuous variable. And there was no significant association with any of the outcomes, regardless of the way that the neoadjuvant therapy duration variable was calculated. So you know, I think overall, these uh, data, um, it's a retrospective study with inherent uh, selection bias and significant limitations. So certainly we shouldn't ex accept this as absolute truth, but I do think from my personal experience that this, that the general findings in this study are, are accurate in that there are a subset of patients with borderline resectable and locally advanced pancreas cancer that do benefit from adjuvant therapy. And right now we need to try, the, the key with hopefully stronger studies and randomized controlled trials in the future is we need to figure out what patients uh, those are. Well, thank you. It was an excellent paper and hopefully it opens us up into those, those prospective trials. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent questions. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Thank you, everyone. All right, our next presentation is uh, Brittle Bones, but Tough as Nails, Parathyroidectomy in the Elderly Population is Beneficial and Safe. Uh, presented by Dr. Haney from Mayo Clinic, Arizona. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to present our research. We have nothing to disclose. So primary hyperparathyroidism was historically noted in profoundly symptomatic patients due to severe bone loss. But more recently, increased screening has identified more asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism patients with hypercalcemia and osteoporosis. Current guidelines recommend surgery for several indications, including age under 50, calcium over one the normal range, 24-hour urine calcium, calcium over 400, evidence of kidney stones or poor kidney function, uh, as well as measures related to bone health, including osteoporosis or radiographic evidence of fragility or vertebral compression fractures. Parathyroidectomy is the only definitive treatment for primary hyperparathyroidism and has been shown to improve bone mineral density by 12 to 14 percent uh, 10 years after parathyroidectomy in one study. Uh, while numerous studies have demonstrated parathyroidectomy is safe in the elderly, the impact on postoperative bone health in this population is not well studied. Therefore, the aim of our study was to examine the outcomes of parathyroidectomy in the elderly population, specifically as it impacts the preoperative workup and the postoperative bone health in these patients. We performed a single institution retrospective chart review of patients who underwent first time parathyroidectomy for primary hyperparathyroidism at our institution from 2010 to 2019. A one-to-one -one matching was performed based on preoperative T-scores to divide patients into two age groups, uh, 75 and older and less than 75, uh, with 100 patients in each group. We were then able to analyze demographics, perioperative clinical factors, and postoperative out outcomes. A subset of this group underwent further analysis on the impact of surgery on bone density based on the availability of postoperative DEXA scans. All 200 patients in the matched cohort had preoperative DEXA scans. 
A first post-operative DEXA scan was available in 88, a second in 46, and 20 patients had a third post-operative DEXA scan. We collected data on bone mineral density from each patient's preoperative DEXA scan, as well as up to three postoperative DEXA scans. We collected both the lowest T-scores as well as any percent change from prior scan based on the least significant change institutional data as provided on the DEXA report. So for example, in this patient's first postoperative DEXA scan, the, their lowest T-score was negative 2.5, and only the AP spine showed significant change in bone mineral density from prior measurements with no changes in the femoral neck. So after the one-to-one -one mass analysis, we had 100 patients, 75 and older, to analyze against 100 patients under 75. In the 75 and older cohort, the average age was 78.8. Patients were a majority female, and there were no significant differences in ASA class, smoking, or diabetes. In regards to preoperative clinical factors, there were no differences between the groups in preoperative labs or the use of anti-resorptive medic medications such as bisphosphonates. The elderly group did have a significantly longer length of symptoms prior to surgery with an average of 2.9 years, about one year longer than their younger counterparts. They also had a longer length of time from their preoperative DEXA scans to surgery at 13.3 months, and that's about six months longer than the under uh, 75 age group. Postoperative outcomes were comparable between the age groups. Overall complication rate was 5% in the 75 and older group and 7% in the younger group, with no significant difference between these groups. Major complications were also very low with uh, permanent hypocalcemia of less than 1%, and no recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries. We found that the 75 and older group experienced significantly higher postoperative fracture rates of 15.1% compared to 2.9%. And lastly, persistent and recurrent disease was similar between the groups with 3% persistence and 8% recurrence overall. In regards to postoperative bone mineral density changes, at the first postoperative DEXA scan, a majority of patients uh, had bone mineral density improvements, so 55% overall. When all these changes were averaged together, there was a 5% improvement in the elderly group and an 8% improvement in the younger group, which was not statistically significant between these groups. But this translated to no average change in the lowest T scores in the elderly group, but an improvement of 0.3 in the younger group, which was significant. By the second and third postoperative DEXA scans, a majority of patients did not experience a change from prior DEXA, with 56% in the second scan and 100% by the third scan. So of note, no patients in either time point had a decline in bone densities from prior scan. And of those that did have a change, it was greater in the 75 and older group with a 24% increase compared to 14%. When comparing T scores at the third DEXA, uh, at the third DEXA to preoperative scores, patients under 75 had a larger improvement in T scores with an increase of 0.7 compared to 0.1 in the 75 and older group. And this figure shows a graphical depiction of those same T score uh, data that we just presented in the previous tables. When comparing to preoperative T scores, it shows a maintenance or improvement at subsequent post-op DEXAs in both groups. So while the younger group had improvements in T-scores after surgery, it is worth noting that the elderly group did not experience any T-score declines and they actually had a small increase of 0.1 by the third scan. And for reference, the first post-operative DEXA, DEXA scans were done on average about a year and a half after surgery. The second scans were almost three years after surgery and the third scans were about four years after surgery. Um, our study is limited in part by its inherent single institution retrospective review design. It also lacks a non-surgical cohort for comparisons, which can be particularly useful in examining the very elderly patients that may not be fit for surgery. Additionally, pre and post-operative DEXA scans were available in only 44%, which further limited our sample size. In conclusion, patients 75 and older can benefit from parathyroidectomy with the greatest proportion of bone density improvements experienced at the first postoperative DEXA scan on average 16.8 months after surgery. Patients 75 and older were more likely to experience a longer delay to surgery, and despite improvements in postoperative bone health, these patients still had higher fracture rates after surgery 
suggesting the multifactorial nature of falls and including physical activity level and polypharmacy in this population. Overall, parathyroidectomy in the elderly is safe with low complication rates comparable to a younger cohort. Prompt surgical referral of elderly patients for consideration of parathyroidectomy is important as older age alone, it should not be considered a contraindication to surgery. Thank you. The discussant for this paper is Dr. Al-Khalili from Texas Tech, El Paso. Hi, um, I'd like to thank Southwestern Surgeon Congress for giving me the chance to be a discussant. Thank you for the authors for the very fast uh, manuscript turnover. So I think you have a great project here. Um, we know from you know, multiple trials and observational studies that parathyroidectomy improves uh, bone uh, mass density. Um, it actually is even superior to antiresorptive therapy in patients with osteoporosis. Uh, but we don't know if which subgroup actually benefits more because sometimes if you look at the uh, trials that have been done so far, it, sometimes it shows that the uh, impact of just not treating the disease doesn't show until maybe 10, 15 years out. So when you consider somebody who's 75 years, you may have an argument for not doing surgery because the it, bad effects of primary hyperparathyroidism are not going to be shown immediately. And that also circles back to the indications based on the international workshop for symptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism that we still use the cutoff of 50 years, although this is, you know, very old data and it needs to be changed, honestly. So uh, I have a couple of uh, questions in a couple of um, reservations on the study. Um, I think one of the things that uh, just stood out to me is that how did you ch choose the age cutoff of 75 as opposed to, you know, any other age cutoff? Um, it's not clear to me, how did you define cure uh, of disease and disease recurrence and disease persistence? Um, because you also mentioned that, you know, um, a certain number of parathyroids was encountered at the first two sections. So did you use um, Miami criteria, dual criteria, or did you use for gland exploration on all patients. Um, the reservation I had is that you only use the T scores. And, you know, if we look at the ICD, um, the International Society of Densitometry uh, recommendations, they actually recommend using the Z scores for younger patients, for premenopausal women and men uh, less than 50 years. So, um, why did so much focus on the T scores and not using the Z scores for this particular? Uh, subgroup. And last, um, the overall fracture uh, risk was shown, but you didn't tell us what kind of fracture uh, did those patients actually develop? Were they actually, you know, compression fractures, hip fractures, or were they actually highly, you know, regular traumatic fractures as opposed to uh, osteoporotic fractures? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for your first question, our age cutoff of 75, we we chose that because uh, clinically, you know, we, we like to, uh, we see some patients in their, their 80s, their 90s that get presented to us for surgical referral. And so we kind of wanted to look at the 80, 90 year old population and by bringing it down to 75, that gave us a little bit of more time for that to kind of develop into like the 80s and 90 year olds uh, that we see kind of uh, fairly often in, in Arizona with our retired population. Uh, for our uh, definitions, we use the AES, uh, the latest uh, guideline recommendations. So for persistence and recurrence, um, persistence was failure of the calcium to normalize um, at all uh, within a six month period. And then recurrence was uh, a, a normalization of your calcium levels, but then within those six months having a recurrence of elevated calcium with the same time period. Um, I, I do note your, your um, discrepancy there with Z scores and T scores. Um, we, we, it was just kind of our study design that we decided to use the T scores. Um, I think that's something that's a little bit more clinically prevalent um, and a little bit more uh, digestible, but I think Z scores would be a good addition to this um, data as well. 
And then for fractures, we just defined all fractures afterwards. So it is a little bit of a kind of a broad net, but we wanted to make sure that we kind of captured all sort of fractures, not necessarily vertebral compression fractures or tra traumatic fractures. And that is probably a little bit of a higher number than, than you know, is maybe clinically relevant in this, in this scenario. Any other questions? Oh, just, oh, go sorry. ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that, you know, the, the overall number of fractures is higher in the elderly, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that is related to your treatment. There's no treatment effect unless you actually show that that increase in the fracture risk in the elderly is related to osteoporotic fractures or pathologic fractures. So very nice presentation. Great job. Um, of course, you know, as, as we all get older, you know, this, this 75 thing, um, is it 75, is it 65, is it 85, is it 95? I think one of the things we're all trying to push is there should be no number. There really shouldn't. It should be, if you can walk in a room with an open mind, I, I know some 85 year olds that can out hike me and I'm in my fifties. I know some, you know, 35 that can't even out swim me or even go snorkeling. So if there's is one thing that we should get away from is this age thing that we put so much emphasis on. Taking out a parathyroid, don't get me wrong, when it's hard, it's hard. When you can't find it, you can't fi find it. But when it's easy, it's so easy. Why in the world would we let 75, 85, 95, 105 even remotely make us not do that operation and they got brittle bones, they can't walk. It's just, it just, I just really want to emphasize that it should not be their age. It should be their physiologic function. When you walk into that room, what do you do every day? And if they say, oh, I go to the store, I cook, I, I walk my dog every day. That's different than, what do you mean, what do I do? I lay in a nursing home bed all day long. That's a whole different ball game. So, but you did, you gave a great presentation and I do not have a question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Andrew. Great paper. Thank you. So that uh, concludes the session and we're gonna roll right into the uh, pause lectureship.